I just want to welcome everyone as people are joining us for this afternoon session and I'm going to give people a few more minutes to join us and then we will get started. Robin, I think you're good to go. Okay, so we are going to get started with today's, this afternoon's part of the conference. I want to start by thanking you all for joining us for this session of Tools for Growing Resilience as a Community. My name is Robin Rosenberg, and I am part of the organizing team for this conference which has been made possible by the Garnett Health Medical Center and by the New York State Parenting Education Partnership that supports parenting educators, parents, and caregivers in creating nurturing environments for children to grow up in. Before we begin, I would like to familiarize you quickly with the features here on Zoom, not that you don't know by now, but just to make sure we know some of the um, best ways to operate in a community meeting like this. While you are not speaking here in this meeting, we would ask you to mute yourself to ensure optimal sound quality for all. You are certainly welcome to leave your video on if you like. Both the video on and off button as well as the mute button are on the bottom of your screen as an icon of a mic and a camera. If you have questions during the presentation, you can put those in the chat and we will be sure to respond there or during the interactive parts of the workshop. You can also show your appreciation or support by using the emoji feature, which should also be at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, depending on the device that you're joining us from, you can choose your view so that you can see multiple people on your screen or just the speaker. You can do that by selecting the gallery view. Finally, please be aware that this session is being recorded. Therefore, if you don't want your face to be recorded, you might wanna turn your camera off, but we certainly welcome either way. 
For those of you who are just joining the conference now and did not have a chance to hear our panel this morning, I would like to introduce our workshop leader. And I uh, hope I am getting the pronunciation correct. Our leader today is Love Odi Kumuyi. Um, Love is a peace building and conflict transformation practitioner. She is the founder and director of Unsiloed, a consulting firm that uses research-driven approaches to build more connected and inclusive communities. Prior to that, she was the inaugural Associate Dean of Conflict Resolution at Cornell University. She developed policies and programs that use alternative dispute resolution tools and bias monitoring data to respond to conflict, crisis, and identity-based concerns. A trained lawyer and practicing mediator and educator, Love has worked locally and internationally, trained hundreds of Peace Corps volunteers and others, and worked on peace building, human rights issues, youth, and gender inclusion projects at the United Nations Development Program in Africa, the Middle East, and the United States. Love holds degrees from the University of London and New York University in law and global affairs, respectively. It is my great pleasure to introduce Love and to turn this forum over to her. Thank you, Robin, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Yulika, for being a wonderful host. And thank you all for um, showing up and signing up to show up here. I'm sure there is no shortage of um, virtual events that are happening right now. Um, I know the fatigue is real for those who might be feeling it. So I am hoping that this is a wholesome session for you and that we, it, it's a little bit unusual for me to ever host a session that's not interactive. So I know most folks are off camera. So you will be doing some interaction. I have that all planned out. And I hope that it's a great session um, for you. So um, I go by the name Love. I am in New York here. And um, I am really excited about the opportunity to share with you a little bit from the work that I've been doing, particularly today in thinking about how restorative practices can help to build resilience. So. I am going to go into presenter mode a little bit, but in the meantime, I'd love to hear from you, if possible, in the chat section, what drew you to this session or what are you hoping to hear um, in this session? If there's anything that you have in mind, I imagine some of you are working on um, very specific issues. So I'd really love to be able to speak very specifically to anything that might resonate with you or just weave those in, in terms of questions that I may be able to answer. So just if you may drop in the chat box, what, what are you hoping to, to gain from our time together? So I'm gonna be pulling from that, doing a bit of screen maneuvering here. Um, Robin, could you check in? Is my screen all good? Can you see? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay. Great. So So some folks are, thanks Thomas, working on substance abuse for youth, thinking about risk or marginalized due to systemic racism. Definitely. So lots of Lots of conversations I think we're all having, particularly this year. Um, one, the health aspects is one, but thinking about the ways in which the pandemic has laid bare a lot of social inequities and really amped up that, se that sense of unsafety in, 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 in the communities where we all live and work and um, try to make a living. So I wanted to start with um, you know, I don't know if, has, if anyone here has heard of restorative justice concepts before. Um, I know that that's a word that has 
picked up a lot of frequency. I recall just a few years ago when I started doing this work at Cornell University, it was, you know, to use the word de um, co colonized or decolonized, sort of like got some gasp in the room as almost something that's, um, that was a dirty word um, in some spaces where I entered where people were like, yeah, maybe we might want to reframe that. So I'm really grateful to hear just like, to see that a lot of folks have embraced this sense of wanting to learn more about how to really address a lot of the social inequities that we are seeing. And like never before, 2020 has exposed a complex rubrics of inequities that plague our society from interpersonal relationships to systems and institutions. So in this session, I really want to explore how, the imp how this might impact exclusion but more so, how can we use some of these practices to build a sense of inclusion and belonging? Particularly, how can we use a transformative approach, restorative justice to build collaboration and resilience? And what does this mean to create a nurturing environment for all? So in today's session, I want to, less so a presentation, but more so a workshop, You know, look a little bit on what is restorative justice, what does that mean? And, touching a few concepts around individualism and collectivism, and we'll get some practice done. I'm hoping that I can show you some of the things that I have been working on um, to maybe cue you in. A typical restorative justice training can be anywhere between 40, a 40 hour week session. So consider this a little bit of a teaser and definitely happy to have offline, off, offline conversations if this is really interesting for you. So I take a trauma-informed approach to my work, although I do not have, you know, if you will, I'm not in the spaces of social worker per se. My background is in law and um, in mediation, but definitely have done the work of trying to ensure that I take that informed approach. And also because my team works predominantly with, um, with adults and, you know, staff members, if you will, or people in a corporate environment, definitely have um, psychologists on our team, social workers who are making sure that we're looking at our trainings and our facilitations to make sure that we are taking that um, approach to build resilience. So to start, to start us off, I just wanted to show you um, what does restorative practices look like. And a lot of the folks, a lot of you may have come across restorative justice and what's on the screen is a, is a triangle in tears. And um, at the top peak of the triangle is thinking about restorative justice as a tool to repair serious harm. And a lot of folks have come across restorative justice in thinking about how to, um, you know, persons who interact with the justice system, the criminal justice system, those who have done things that would cause them to be, if you will, pun penalized or taken some punitive um, methods is, is one way that I think a lot of folks come across restorative justice. Another one is oftentimes used within the classroom or within organizations to manage difficulties and disruptions. Um, so oftentimes to address situations in relation to students. I want to really focus on the latter part, which we don't talk as much of, but within restorative practices is really um, the area where we use restorative practices to build community as opposed to using it just as a response for when bad things happen. The sweet spot for restorative justice is that we engage in community, we're building community all the time so that we're even more aware of when something goes wrong or in some of the conflict um, work that I do, we call it early warning signals, we're able to pick up the early warnings because we are so used to being in community with each other. So it's re that's the piece about creating resilience, not just waiting for something to go wrong, waiting for the police or whoever it is, a superintendent to get involved before we think about restorative justice. But I want to focus this session on the, the foundation of this um, practice, which is a practice that's really inherent in building community. So you may again have come across restorative justice as a way to offer an intentional opportunity to come together and to process um, things that has happened, right? So 
probably from a judicial lens, right? And I have seen that in that judicial lens before, but restorative justice really is embedded at its core in black and indigenous practices. So more commonly known in the North American space is the indigenous native, um, native American or native Indian practices. I by birth am West African and I have sat in restorative justice circles from as young as seven years old in villages in Nigeria, for example. Um, so when we think about doing work that brings in marginal, historically marginalized groups, restorative justice is also an opportunity to create community for people who that's the cultural ways in which their families have always created community, right? So this is nothing about um, responding to harm, but the ways in which family members have sat together in their living rooms, in their yards, um, on wherever it is and have sat and have had heart to heart conversations and had difficult com conversations, that's the starting point. So that when something goes wrong, everybody knows that this is our way of life as opposed to res introducing restorative justice only when something goes wrong. And from most of you here will know, if there is now trauma associated with a certain type of process, then there, there's a chance that there becomes a negative association between restorative justice and building community when it actually should be the other way around, right? If restorative justice has a, if restorative circles have a, positive connotation, like this is where we build community, this is where we connect. So when things fall out of kilter, we can go back to that place to rebuild and repair when harm has been done. So another place that some of you may have come across restorative justice is you know, within um, the school environment, college environments, it's been quite popular, but there is more. And I put this, um, I'm sharing this image here because I shared earlier, that I have sat in restorative circles from as young as the age of seven, which was quite a bit ago. And this is one of those circles. This is a photograph from my mom's village in, um, in Southern Ni Nigeria, which is in West Africa. And this is a regular Saturday morning circle, right? Restorative circle um, where community members come together and they resolve issues they plan for community events, they get together and they use this opportunity to not only build community, but also to repair harm. So I have been leaning into this model um, a lot now, translated it into the virtual space and using it, especially within organizations who are really grappling with one, a sense of feeling isolated, um, probably people feeling in crisis a lot. How can we use these practices? Not waiting for something to go wrong within our organizations, but to begin to start to say, how can we build community using these practices? So that's really what I want to, throughout today's session, use several touch points and use particularly the theme of creating belonging. Um, to see if I can give you a, a window into how some of these practices can be used. So I'm going to start with sharing one of my the agenda. This is a this is a sample agenda that I have been using over the last few months within many many organizations. So a lot of folks have never heard the word restorative practices before. So this is um, an agenda that it's it's called a five C agenda. And restorative practices really is, if we were in a physical space, we, will all be, we would all be sitting here like you saw in that um, photograph from the village, sitting together shoulder to shoulder. There's really no sense of um, power imbalance. People all commun you know, communally contributing. And this is highly unconventional for a lot of folks. A lot of folks are used to a linear agenda. They're used to, we go in, we do this, we check off this box and we keep it moving. Well, the ways in which that we process stuff, especially when there's trauma in the room can be sometimes a little bit more cyclical or circular, less so can we say, well, it's, you know, it's time to stop feeling this feeling or it's time to, to move on. Like we have built community. So the idea is creating a space where people can convene, creating a space where people can connect creating a space where people can talk about the things that are concerning to them, and then also making space to collaborate. 
And then I have added the, the closed piece, which is there's a huge piece around confidentiality. So in the sessions that I have facilitated, oftentimes they are not recorded. Um, so this, um, you know, you probably will never come across this uh, visual agenda because every time I facilitated this session, they're, they're never out there. And generally I invite folks to take the opportunity to share the stories and the skills and the lessons remain um, the skill, the stories remain, but the skills and the lessons are yours to take, to transform, to treasure, right? So helping people to understand that they can share openly in a space confidentially and that they will be supported. And a key aspect of restorative practice is to build a sense of courage to share. So there are opportunities, there are several prompts that someone might use to say how, you know, how are you feeling about X, right? In thinking about how you feel about X or whatever um, topics is, which we are going to practice one of that in a moment, you give people several opportunities to self-express, to process, to make space between what you're asking them. So there is no one that's sort of like fighting for space, right? Sometimes we might find that we are in a room and a dominant voice is taking up air in the room, right? Especially if people have been raised with a level of privilege or a little a level of entitlement to a sense of space. They might be very vocal, whereas some folks might be a little bit reserved in the way that they lean into that space. So there's one thing that we can do and I feel most folks do is give um, verbal assurances. The safest, this place is safe. You can speak, you can trust me. The technical piece is can you integrate processes that actually ensure that safety. And how you ensure that safety is creating um, an order for which people will share, helping people understand what we're doing in this space and how we are going to be flowing through that process. So that's just one example of how I use a restorative practice in the work that I do currently. So one that we are, I, I, I want to just practice what I just shared in. So if we were thinking about convening the space and let me say we themed this conversation belonging and psychological safety and I'm going to use that theme all through. So generally speaking, I would limit the number of participants, for example, that are in, a, in an environment, especially when it's virtual, it gets a little bit challenging. Um, so, one way to think about that is to ask folks, folks to one share, share something about them that helps us to convene the space. So I, I'm, I, on the screen here is share a time in your life when you feel like you really belong or what does belonging mean to you? And if we were able to all speak and so on, it we would take the time and go around in a physical circle and actually share one by one, everyone making space for that. Um, an even um, earlier stage to that that I have used is to have people, I generally don't like to go in with ground rules, but ask people to co-create the ground rules. So as we come together in this space, what values are important for you as we get together? I generally recommend to invest, to invest time in co-creating shared values if you find that you're going to be with a group of people for a very long time. So if I were to lead a session that was a day long or four hours long or a series, I would probably invest the first 30 minutes to an hour of that session in a simple question of what do you need from this space to feel courageous? What do you need from this space to feel safe? What do you need from this space to feel safe to contribute? It takes a different tone than saying, when you come here, this is what you need to do. Let me lay down the law because I control everything and I am all powerful and I know right what's on the agenda. The thing about restorative processes is that it values storytelling. It values the voices of the people in the room. So just to take a pulse on your voice, I have um, collaborated, I'm going to use a tool here in the chat box, you will see something called a Mentimeter and the Mentimeter will take you to a space which is a, a virtual assisted voice um, collaborative space since there are about 30, almost 30 of us here. So 
let's just use this to fast forward that sense of, of, of sharing. Um, and it's going to ask you a quick question on what does belonging mean to you? And this is something that you can facilitate, you know, if you have a group of, of, of you know, whether staff members or if you will, students, um, participants. And this also isn't about waiting for conflict to happen. It's about going a step further and saying, let's use what we know about what people need to feel a sense of belonging to begin to weave that into the type of work that we do. Um, let's begin to use that to um, build and create a culture that's intentionally inclusive, right? Like let's not wait for a big incident to happen, but let's use this to take a pulse on how folks are feeling. So one way to facilitate that, and I have, in as best as possible, try to just, again, facilitate this sense of collaboration, right? A psychological safety is deeply connected with people feeling like they can have voice. So here is some voice coming through. Thank you all for sharing. If you haven't seen in the chat box, you'll see a link to something called menti.com. And um, also if you haven't seen it, if you look on the screen, if you go to menti.com and use the code 5629693, it will also get you there. So we're seeing here that people what does belonging mean to them? So people say they want, you know, feel safe, being accepted, being understood and seen, connection, at home to speak, quite powerful, a sense of being welcomed, common purpose, relatability. So it's really important that, you know, as we go for it in whatever work that we do, whatever spaces that we are creating, if we begin to engage in collaboratively bringing people's voices together as the way that we engage, when things go wrong, then it wouldn't be so scary to engage in, in, in that way. Um, so are you able to see my Mentimeter results on the screen? Um, Robin or Yulika can give me a yes, thumbs up. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. <laughs> so, so that, that's just one way that um, you can facilitate voice. This is one thing that I've been using to integrate um, using restorative practices as a way to support this sense of knowing what people need to feel a sense of belonging. So just to shift again, I'm gonna be going back, back and forth between the technical pieces and interactive pieces, just to keep it interesting for you all. Um, so just going forth a little bit in terms of, so what does restorative justice mean, right? If restorative justice were to be a building, it will have four corner posts, right? Um, inclusion of all parties, encountering the other side, making amends for harm and re reintegration in, um, of parties into communities. So when you see, there's a visual on the screen with um, four quadrants. And sometimes we might be doing this trauma-informed work and building community, but sometimes that gets in the way of like autonomy and voice because we do high, high, high support but low on the control. So which means that it's sort of like permissive to some degree, right? So we might in our effort to support folks um, unknowingly get in the way of um, the sense of, of, of control or giving, you know, creating the, the boundaries that they need. And, and the, the, the alternative is also true. If you were to think of restorative justice as, um, if you will, a model or if that sort of like L, that angle, there's a bit of support and there's a bit of accountability. So we all want to support people as a community, but making sure that there are some boundaries as to what does that look like? Um, and in, in particular, thinking about how 
if someone violates the values that we've all put brought together, then how do we become accountable? So in the word cloud that you all shared, so someone said belonging means um, being allowed to have voice, right? There's a piece of it then that we say, so what does being allowed to have voice look like? The, the largest word on that word cloud was safety. Safety is a very, what does safety mean? What safety means to me as a person isn't the same thing that safety might mean to you, right? Like you or I may have experienced different forms of trauma um, and safety might mean a different thing. I want to take that idea of safety even deeper. Because of the work that I have done in relation to um, countering bias and countering exclusion, I am keenly aware sometimes of the ways in which people weaponize the word safety. And in particular, um, you all may have, I'm sure, um, heard of the case of Amy Cooper earlier in the summer, who was in Central Park, who called the police on a black man who was feeding birds and said, I feel unsafe because there's a black man here feeling, um, feeding birds, right? Like I am going to call the police to say that I feel unsafe, right? So that was something that got a lot of national attention because she just weaponized the word unsafe. And that is the word that has been weaponized by lots of folks who have access to power who have access to control to say, I am feeling unsafe. And so you must take action on my behalf, right? Like action on my behalf might be whoever has power, right? So it depends on who gets to the police first, who gets to the principal first, who gets to HR first and declares their unsafeness. They're the ones who get that, that protection, right? So, you know, making sure that as we create spaces, we have some sense of what do people need to feel safe or whatever it is that they're asking as we are creating community, but also defining and demystifying what some of these words that we use that we have taken for granted um, to call, you know, if I say I feel safe, um, who, you know, when we think again, historically, um, the accuser of Emmett Till felt unsafe, right? Unsafe. So here we are, if someone says, I feel unsafe. Um, what does safety mean? Safe, like it, it, the real or perceived nature of safety. And this is a very delicate conversation because in doing trauma-informed work, of course, we don't want to challenge people's sense of safety. But what does that mean when it might touch and concern issues of exclusion or issues of discrimination or um, racially charged behavior? What, what does that mean when we begin to have these conflicts between what people might interpret one word to mean versus the other? So just some food for thought as something that has come up in the work that I do, which I've sort of like termed as sort of like weaponizing um, sense of safety. And I like this um, quote here because it shows up a lot in the work that I do. It's like, we can disagree and still love each other until your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of humanity and right to exist. So I like this quote by Robert Jones, who writes a lot on um, Sons of Baldwin. It's certainly um, an area that we should think about just in the, there are ways in which a lot of folks are doing work that are expecting them to be very neutral in how they assess situations. And sometimes our neutrality might get in the way of just being able to see some systemic oppressive um, behaviors that might be showing up in, in the work that we do. So as, as you know, on the topic of neutrality, the idea of restorative justice, the idea of restorative or transformative work is really about creating um, community. And I want to highlight that one of the ways in which um, we're a little bit challenged because culturally speaking, Northern American culture or um, Western Europe isn't necessarily um, a culture of collectivism and interconnectedness, right? It's a self-made man, the bootstrap, individualism, take responsibility, like, you know, I am what I am and that's all that I am kind of um, speak. 
but restorative practices out of Black and Indigenous populations and cultures is really about collectivism. It's really about this, um, the South African phrase here that I'm using is Ubuntu. I am because we all are, right? My humanity is bound up in yours. So if we now begin to use these restorative principles as a starting point for building community, like I said, not waiting to, to fall back into this when things go wrong, but using that as a starting point, then we can create a more wholesome, resilient community rather than using these practices only as a way to, um, to, to address the, you know, the, the judicial system, right? So there's just so much more potential for us to tap into. Another key principle, and what I'm, you know, the next few slides just really challenging and taking that very decolonized approach to restorative practice. It's one of my um, views, probably personal, has been written about in other ways that, um, you know, restorative practices, mediation, a lot of the, um, the alternative practices that we use still have their roots in a lot of whiteness, right? And, and if we are going to be taking a, an anti-racist lens, if we are going to be taking a lens of equity and inclusion, we have to be more conscious of the ways in which we might be perpetuating harm in some shape or form. And what this means is that sometimes there is a sense of universality that, you know, one method is going to serve everything. So I know there, there, there might be practices and processes that we might use. And, you know, sometimes someone really famous comes up with a methodology and says, oh, this is a great way. Like, this is going to solve all our problems. And then we like funnel everyone <laughs> through this new, great, brilliant um, way of doing things because you know someone has written a shiny book about it and rolled out tons of training. And then now we're gonna get a bunch of funding um, to really push it forward. So it's really about making sure that we don't get too rigid and legalistic. Of course, there are things that we want to have boundaries around, but we want to make sure that we don't get so rigid and legalistic because except an author or the creator of a methodology has really done um, intersectional research, then we should be really concerned because if predominantly um, a method of doing something was based on um, a monolithic population and has not really looked at the different lived experiences of other populations, then we're going to be really challenged in creating like blanket processes. And, you know, one of them is for a long time, I have come across methodologies in the restorative or other um, transformative work that really says, oh, this is applicable across races, across genders. And we increasingly are knowing that that's not the case. I think in the earlier panel, someone had said, you know, we are recognizing that there are different outcomes for this type of processes for girls as it is for boys. Like while we might want to be very gender neutral on certain things, we know that, you know, maybe black girls at a certain age experience things different from white boys at a certain age from a different demographic. So um, a key part of a restorative practice is figuring out how to meet people where they are, give them what they need, and to be culturally responsive in that way. Um, another part here is, and um, you know, these are, I, I just have to touch them at a very high level, is just to think about ways in which, um, you know, ensuring that we are decolonizing, decentralizing how power um, knowledge is used. I think that's something that most folks who are in the trauma-informed world know and understand, but also just like demystifying certain words or concepts. So I will speak very, um, you know, from my personal ex experience. So I, I like to use this word as, as simple as mindfulness, right? The onset of the word mindfulness, which is a very simple, I would say, sound now sounding very welcoming word. What does that mean for folks who are probably not North, North American, right? So if you're in a space where you're interacting with a heavy immigrant population and you're saying, hey, let's do this mindfulness activity, like what does that mean for them? What does that mean for probably their own cultural 
and religious practices that may not necessarily have opened their world to that. Whereas I know that there are some folks who have been doing mindfulness practices from they were three years old, right? Like with their, with their grandparents. So just making sure that we are very aware of how knowledge moves and creating more space where there's more of an equal egalitarian or equitable way of understanding each other. And there's sort of like no judgment um, in that space. So I want to, and, and the, the last piece which I have touched on really is making sure that, you know, communication across cultural lines certainly differ, right? Um, how can we make sure that we are having conversations that is very aware of cultural differences? So those are just, I will say, very um, landmark, if you will, principles in restorative justice that I, you know, I just wanted to bring to four. So I, I started out with a, th that tiered triangle where you know, at the top of it, we have for the most part spent a lot of our energy in the penal system, in the justice system. But at the bottom of the tier is how can we use restorative practices to develop healthy relationships? to build social emotional understanding, to promote and strengthen a sense of belonging and ownership. Really in, in restorative practices, that is where 80% of the work is. However, because of the ways in which I would say the practice has gotten a little bit colonized, we've, we're overwhelmingly spending um, our time using restorative practices to right wrongs, to take care of only bad things rather than using it to build community. So that's a bit of my call to action here is to, as you explore restorative practices closely to think about ways in which we're using it to build community and not hyper-focusing it as a practice that's solely for, if you will, a pseudo judicial process. Um, here's a more detail that I know may not be super visible to a lot of folks. There are ways in which this can happen. So we can think about, you know, creating community between two people, creating community between two people and a mediator, creating impromptu spaces to respond to challenging behaviors. But at the higher scale, like large scale community building, community planning. So for example, and a direct application of this is um, if we are doing work um, within communities, we might not think, we might think of, well, this is just developing the community. We are going to create a resource center, right? And this is, I've, I saw this a lot in the work that I did globally. A lot of well-meaning international organizations would go or, you know, folks travel and they're like, well, we are going to build a school or, you know, we are going to build a library, right? And you might not think of this as a conflict situation. It doesn't seem like a space where you might need restorative justice work. Um, but there were no shortage of case studies that showed that there's lots of money and time and resources invested in a really brilliant program. And then there was no uptake, right? And I define conflict as a crisis of human interaction. One set of folks thinks that this is brilliant and great. And there's another set of folks who are just like, what is this and how does this solve our problems, right? So we might not call that a conflict, but it, it's a sort of a crisis there. And then what you end up happening, ha have happening is spending lots of years doing an uphill battle of convincing people why something is great when we haven't really made space to listen and to take into consideration what they need. So, you know, we might think, oh, here is, you know, I think a lot of folks do this in the sense of community consultations, right? So you come in and you say, we, we need X and we need um, to make a particular change. And it's not unusual that that change shows up as a fancy PowerPoint or a plan that's already drawn up by someone in a fancy corporate office somewhere else, right? So if we say we want to take care of a particular issue, have we sat down in circle? Have we sat down in community with people to listen to their heart, to have them speak from their heart, to have them express themselves freely without rehearsal, to have them express themselves without um, any fear of judgment of whether they're saying this in the right way or not? So how can we use restorative practices 
to create and to build community so that through those dialogues, people are able to even build that resilient community for themselves. So that's really um, a lot of the focus um, of, of my work. And I want to shift again to you know, trying this out with you all. And if we were to use again that theme of creating a sense of belonging. So for example, you know, we are at an organization, a school, a workplace, and we want to talk about creating a sense of belonging. One, we don't have to wait until something goes really wrong to create a sense of belonging. We can actively have conversations all the time around the themes and the issues that are important to us, defining what those issues are and beginning to interrogate them deeply. So it's really about inviting the unseen and unspoken, making the implicit explicit and understanding harms and needs. So we have been talking a lot about implicit bias and unconscious bias, I imagine the last few months, but then how do you actually bring this alive? So unconscious bias, for example, is about um, you know, being more aware of the ways in which we can be exclude, excluding to others, right? So we can learn that from an educational sort of like cerebral point of view, but then to actually ask people, what does exclusion feel like to you, right? Like what does belonging feel like to you? When was a time that you experienced exclusion and um, what made that challenging for you? So that's a way to not just convene but to get people to connect at around, you know, around a, a, a particular question. So I'm gonna have um, Yulika, if you can drop in the chat for me, the second question, which is share a time in your life when you um, did not feel a sense of belonging, right? Like what did that, or rather when, when you felt that you really belonged, right? So sometimes, again, taking that more positive approach of not just waiting for something to go wrong, but to begin to explore what do people want? Like what, what's a good memory of feeling a sense of belonging? And can we replicate that sense of belonging? So in the chat below, you'll see uh, a link to a mentee and some stories might come through and I'll be sharing that with you. Um, just a quick note, I, I'm so sorry. I think the chat that I just did, the link I just put in was the third one instead of the second. So whatever is the latest corresponds to the question that you just asked. Okay, great. I think you shared the same one again. <laughs> oh, it's this, oh, maybe then it's. Yes, I think you're correct. What you shared is correct, no worries. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It happens. <laughs> um, so, so as you share, I, um, I have, I have another um, slide that I wanted to show you here. And as you know, you all share. I think this sort of important, right? So, I, I, I use the word safety as an example. So, I like this quote by Ibram X. Kendi, who, who's you know, written the book that a lot of folks know around anti-racism and he shares that definitions anchor us in principles. This is not a light point. If we do not do the basic work of defining the kind of people we want to be in stable, in language that is stable and consistent, then we can't work towards stable, consistent goals. So I have on the screen here, for example, some very basic words. So this is, a, again, I'm advocating for a more positive use of restorative justice or restorative practices to build community, right? So if a group of people generally understand, so what does respect mean to us? What does it mean to feel interconnected? Like I imagine for a lot of words that we use in the communities that we create, everyone has their own interpretation of that word. So thinking about this as an opportunity to make space to help people, you know, when we say dialogue, what does that mean? I mean, if anyone has had any challenging work situation where someone says we need to talk, I mean, I don't know what histories you all have, but if for many years, if I ever heard someone say we need to have a conversation, 
I would be sweating, right? Like that doesn't get me feeling like a sense of belonging, right? So I had to lean into other words um, that were less triggering for me based on <laughs> we need to talk and what that has meant from like my childhood maybe, right? So just creating a way that we can be more explicit in what we need to create community so that, you know, if in some ways there is harm in a community, we begin to understand that um, we have a shared language and a shared understanding around what that means. So I am gonna go forward and um, share, looks like we have some great shares and stories so far. Again, I would have, you know, in the ideal scenario, um, but you, you know, you all would be, you know, sitting in probably breakout groups and, and sharing, but some folks have been so kind to share, to say um, a time that they felt belong where people accept diverse groups of thoughts. Um, when I come home and my spouse and children greet me with excitement. So belonging for them isn't necessarily at work, right? Like belonging is at home, meeting a group of people for lunch. As troop leaders, connecting with other troop leaders um, around events. Each time friends get together for social events, awesome when people ask me for advice so here's just like a very brief snippet here right so if i were to choose one that's as simple as meeting a group of people for lunch right seems very simple but you know in a, in a particular work environment we might say well let's do an activity to help people feel a sense of belonging like let's do game night right like let's do this and this and this and fanfare and funfetti but maybe a bunch of folks just want to meet for lunch and have conversations and have a heart to heart connection right so again this is the power of having these very proactive conversations so that you know as we grow in community, we are thinking about ways in which we can amplify diverse thoughts and beliefs. We can make space for a Zoom call with my FCS team in Orange County. Very, very specific, right? Um, whereas some folks might be like, no more Zoom calls for me. Like, I just want a social distance coffee break, right? So how can we begin to use these opportunities of asking simple, authentic, questions that are in line with restorative practices to create a greater sense of interconnectedness. So um, I, I see two um, responses around asking for advice and opinions. So it sounds like people feel a sense of belonging when they are able to contribute to their community, either as troop leaders or providing advice or taking time. Um, when someone takes the time to ask for my opinion and takes that into consideration. Right. So again, some opportunities, again, to build a sense of belonging and we're building a sense of belonging, not waiting for, again, for the community to be broken first. Right. But proactively so that if the community breaks down, we know that our way of getting together is, hey, let's have a lunch. Let's have a Zoom call to reconnect because we know that this is our mode of connection when it comes to creating a sense of community. So I want to, and Yulika, this is, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think at some point I know that we were able to do breakouts um, and I wanted to give that an, a, a shot. <laughs> if anyone was up for it and have some folks here um, even go deeper, but within the small group space. So one more prompt that I have, and usually in restorative practices, you might have, you know, sometimes four to five prompts, depending on what it is, and everyone gets a chance to process and go deeper. So my ultimate go deeper question, you know, one way that I use, you know, creating understanding and building inclusive communities to think about psychological safety. And my definition of psychological safety, which is not um, mine own, the, 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 one of the persons who writes on this work, Amy um, Edmondson of Harvard University, as well as Tim Clark, who has written and published in March of this year, Psychological Safety at Work. Um, and he defines this as, it's not too expensive to be yourself. 
I like that definition. It's very clear, right? Like, and I have had so many conversations the last few months um, with folks saying, you know, with all of the civil awareness, they're recognizing how much it's been too expensive to be themselves, to really speak their truth, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to invite you all to probably explore this in breakout um, briefly, and I'll be happy for a time check. So it's really question three, you know, as you think about psychological safety, maybe you all can share as a group in round, you know, if maybe you're three or four or five in the room. So when was it, um, when do you know that it's too expensive to be yourself? And, um, oh, and I have a spelling error. When do you know that it's not too expensive to be yourself? So what are some positive and negative markers? When do you know that it's not too expensive? And when do you know that it's, and these sound like a little bit of a vague question right now, but these are intentional because they're open enough for people to find themselves in, in that space and tell their own authentic story. Um, and I sort of lead with one of my legal hats where never ask a question where the answer is yes or no, because <laughs> that's a dead end. Um, so just from a practice point of view, you will find that I have very open-ended questions um, just so that people can find themselves in that story, right? Or just like ask, so what does this mean? And I generally will say, whatever is speaking to you, that's, that's what it means, right? So they can come in with that. So I think, Yulika, can we do 10 minutes in breakout? Yeah, absolutely. And do you, right. how many people do you want in one room? Three to um, four? So, yeah. So I think we can do four. Four, four in one room. Um, seems that that might work. And what I'm also going to do is drop in the chat or I'll, I'll allow Yulika to broadcast to all the groups, the, the prompts. Yep. So just in case. Yep. Perfect. So here comes the invitation. probably have some folks who are just listening. Mm -hmm. two, two. Yep, I'm just moving. So I'm moving folks around. Yeah. Okay. I think we're good with time. So at 2.06 or something, we'll call folks back. It's like, am I going too fast? But I think I got, I think I got it all in. <laughs> yes, yes, you're great. Yeah, and I know Angela, she's probably multitasking. So oh, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm sure. No, this is great. And I got um, a direct message from someone who said, this is fantastic. And she had to run to another, actually, this was our director. Um, she had to run to a meeting with Chris Watkins from the extension direction. Mm. <laughs> So, yeah. so helpful, the concepts, how you are putting that. It's really like right on with what we're working on. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, oh, I was, I was hoping I was like, okay, maybe I can do a bit of teach, but also practice in the, in the space and, and do that a little bit of a dance. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, Nick Pantaloni, who was on the panel with you this morning, he will be interested in knowing more um, just because, you know, they're really working on creating um, nurturing communities. So um, for their school environment and they have incorporated some restorative justice practices. Do you know, mm -hmm. 
Um, Joachim Latte. No, I don't. He's uh, he's been in this area for many years and working in restorative justice. Justice, and he works with BOCES oftentimes. Oh, okay. Um. So yeah, he's from Ghana. So I, you know, it's almost nice. neighbors. <laughs> no. Yeah. Practically. Not quite, but almost. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, in the chat, I actually dropped the questions, and I maybe you can oh. broadcast it. Some. Yep. I don't know. It's a hit or a miss. Sometimes it's Zoom. They can't see. Um, they can't see the questions, but they yeah. can't see the chat after they disappear. <laughs> Here we go. Yep, I sent it. Um, And um, but it seems like the, the morning session had a great turnout. That's great. Um, yeah. So we had a lot more registrants for this workshop as well, but oftentimes people, you know, you register and you can't come, you hope for the recording, so. Right, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm one of those. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> a lot of times, yeah. Or maybe you can spare, you know, a one, yeah, it's just a lot in one day. Yeah. This is so different, right? So I, I imagine you would have been running between rooms and snacks and <laughs> yeah, lunch. So yeah, I have to say, I mean, as much as I was excited um, today, I do miss the fact that we couldn't all be in one room. I mean, imagine the synergy in yeah. person. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Like, here we are, like, December. <laughs> yeah. Wait, I mean, yeah. you you clearly had a lot of foresight because I think back in March when people started to postpone, people said, oh, July, right? Like you went straight down <laughs> and I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess she's not been very hopeful, but you were right on target. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, well, but you have a lot of people with decision making power in your group here. So I'm really thrilled about this because, you know, they have influence. Mm -hmm. And um, that's we want to influence our communities. What type of organizations are are you seeing folks with decision making power here? Um, government basically representation in different you know health and human services here uh, county representation youth organization community organization um, teaching so educators adult educators yes. yeah that's who i know mm -hmm. so yeah So there, 
I think I might do one more, Menzi. Yeah, which I think yeah. you have. I have the one. It's the one about work, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Are you closing the room? Uh, not yet. I think um, somebody might have just joined. So hi, if you're just joining us, we're in breakout rooms at the moment. We'll close the rooms in two minutes. And then everyone will come back and we will continue. Yeah, so I'll close the rooms now. That gives everybody exactly a minute. It's the one minute warning. <laughs> that scary time countdown. Yeah. <laughs> I was tempted to have this question first, just because of, because I know when everyone comes back, they all come back with their camera on. <laughs> it's the oddest thing to be in breakout um, <laughs> with no cameras. So thank you all. Um, I imagine for some folks that felt like really short time, um, but for those who were able to share and connect, I'm curious, does anyone have any insights, um, whether from what you shared or just even the process of sharing? Just feel free to unmute yourself and contribute. I'll talk. Thanks, Thomas. Um, I'm an artist in general, so I'm not a very linear thinker. So I'm just gonna relay what my team talked about, but it might not be linear. So it might just be like poetry. In line so, with what we do, right? Yeah. So, so Mariana and Erica were my team members. Um, we Words that came up were things like slowing down. We are a culture of, of moving, about moving. Um, in that, uh, the truth, something about the truth came out and is that kids can be in pain and, and need to process and heal first before a truth can even be addressed. That there are things, and, and Mariana and Erica, please, shape and do whatever you want to what I'm saying. We talked about doing versus being, like what you do versus what you are and balancing out, causing no harm and trying to maintain a sense of balance when you want to express what you feel, uh, but also consider others and trying to find, it doesn't always, it's not always as easy as something like an apple and an orange where you know the apple's an apple and an orange is an orange. It's like, it just can't be categorized and you feel like, how do we come to balance? Um, so that was our notes, yeah, or my, my notes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for sharing. Thank you all. Uh, Marianne, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Robin. So my group consisted of myself and um, Mary Pat and Donna Britt. And uh, uh, thank you to my wonderful partners in this. We, we were very, maybe we were a lot more linear than that one. <laughs> but, 
we 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 defined um, and hopefully these were the right questions. What makes it too expensive to be yourself, or and and when do you know when it's not too expensive? So the for the first one, when do you know it's too expensive? We talked about either real or perceived repercussions from speaking out or even um, just the lack of responsiveness to speaking out and how you perhaps you can speak out, but then when your words don't move things along, you, you kind of give up. And then for when do you know it's not too expensive, it's when you feel that your words and contributions are valued and heard and listened to and, and acted upon. Quite powerful. And, and I really love how both of both groups just hearing from two so far just made it theirs, right? Like, and, and those are not disconnected, right? So how can we one, slow down and make sure that we are noticing when these things are happening? And also how can we, on the other hand, be more conscious that when people give voice to things that are concerning to them, that we are able to action on this. And um, curious to hear any other group that has a burning contribution that they'd like to um, bring forward. It, even if you're not sharing about the actual question, but just like, what was it like to even share um, on, on, on the, the prompts? I love, I would just share, in my group, we had uh, Alyssa, Debbie, and Robert. Um, and one of the things different from what others have said so far is we talked about how our roles um, influence our uh, feelings of safety. So depending on what role we're in and, and the environments that we're in, it really um, can dictate sometimes the extent of expressing ourselves and feeling safe and comfortable. Yeah, thank you, Darcy. Yeah, definitely power comes in here. And I, I chose this, which is a very complex, um, it can be a very complex question and we could spend um, quite some time on this because this is one of the tools that sometimes I choose to apply as an alternative to a survey, right? Um, sometimes we take very linear approaches, like, are you happy here? Or like, you know, like what what do you need or would you would you recommend this place to a friend right like that doesn't quite get us to I I think I have voice here right like I feel like I have a sense of being here um or I would hope that we can slow down here um so sometimes again in decolonizing the way we share information collect information we have a lot of opportunity to build community by not using the linear um, overly academic and which I can appreciate as an academic myself, like approaches, right? Like just making sure that we are truly making space for voice. Um, but this question about building safety and what does safety mean for you is something that we can explore depending on where we are. So if you are in leadership, you can, um, you know, a lot of Organizations are saying we need to diversify leadership. Well, yes, you can diversify your board, you can diversify your senior leadership team, but then if folks come in and they don't feel like um, they are able to express themselves in that space where they might be just one or two of 10 or 50, then you haven't created a space that will retain them as a psychologically safe environment, right? Like we need to diversify our schools. Like, okay, that's great, right? Like, are you doing this in a tokenizing way? Have you found out what those people who you're bringing in need? And are you sure that you're not just going to not do more, do no harm, but my standard is do more good. Like if you're not doing more good, then you probably don't want to mess around in that area, right? Um, I mean, it's, if it's not an emergency situation, if you will. Um, so when we think about creating um, a resilient culture as everyday experience, that's just something that we might want to give some thought to, to get quite creative in making space for voice, making space for contributions, and making space for more nuanced um, interpretations of the words and the stories and the questions that we are asking. So to wrap up, um, 
I, you know, just in case there's anyone, because I'm a very famous collector of prompts for um, discussion, one that I have here that we probably can't jump into is what values are important to you to feel a sense of belonging, right? Like what values are important? And, and why I'm lifting this up is that because depending on um, whether we look generationally or racially or culturally, for example, a word like respect is a loaded word. Um, and I, I say this because there are some things that I might see, um, uh, I don't know, a teenager in a supermarket um, in suburban America do that I know that um, an African-American teenager from the South could never dare try that with their parent, right? Like in terms of like how respect is defined, right? So sometimes our sense of what we define um, the things that we define, like the values that we are invited into a certain space, you know, a lot of companies and organizations says like, these are our values and our missions, right? Sometimes we also experience values violations, right? Like we say this is a value, but I'm not experiencing this here. So what do I do about this? Like, how do I give voice to that, right? Like, do I just keep walking in and seeing that on a signpost and under everyone's signature? How can we have conversations around these values violations? So my our wrap up um, in the um, prompt, you'll see um, Yulika is gonna drop for us again, our third mentee, which I have um, changed a little bit. <laughs> I was, was more so going to be, a, it was more so about, um, you know, what would, you need to feel safe at work, but I, I wanted to go a little bit deeper in terms of what do you need to learn, right? So this is a question about skills. So sometimes we might say, I want to do this and this is great to be done, but we also come to the table with very different levels of experiences. Um, I have found that particularly um, quite important in the last few months, a lot of folks have put up their hands and said, um, I want to be part of the diversity committee in my, com you know, in my company, right? I want to be, I want to volunteer, like I want to be part of the book club, right? And I work with a lot of corporate clients or organizational clients. Um, and I am in a space where we're like, okay, so let's put together this committee, like let's pull together this charter and one person might not know about this, whereas one person has studied this for their whole lives. So making sure that we are making space to close some of the knowledge and skills gap so that we are actually doing the same work that we claim to be doing. So sometimes you might need to ask questions around what do you need to feel supported, but also what do you need to, what do you not know? Um, or what do you know? And how can we create communities of learning as well as we are creating these communities of transformation and um, change making. So curious to hear, as you've been thinking about the sense of belonging, which is a theme that I'm using in parallel just to show you how we can use restorative practices. It's really about how, what do you need to learn um, about to be an advocate for inclusion? And we, I have just a few, responses so far and and would really love to hear more from you and I think this is also just an important question that sometimes we haven't asked ourselves because we've just assumed a sense of well all knowing or you know not safe to express that we don't know how to create a sense of inclusion right because it's it's so expected right like how can you not know like this is important so while you fill that in, if there's anyone who has any question, I am quite um, interested in hearing any questions or thoughts about what we've shared so far as we um, begin to wrap up this session and um, which is was supposed to sort of be an insight on how to use restorative or transformative practices to build um, resilience, right? So just some takeaways, thinking about using restorative practices, not just as a response or as a criminal justice tool, but using it from the foundational aspect of building community in a creative way. How can we use 
Um, how can we create, restore, use restorative justice as the norm, not as the exception, so people don't have a negative association, um, sort of like an, a tra trauma association between restorative justices for everything bad, you know, for people, only people who are incarcerated or people who have any interactions with the police system, but knowing that this is a space where people can sit down in community shoulder to shoulder and get to know each other and get to ask the vague questions and get to explore their history and also get to co-create a future um, that is beautiful and connected for all. So some of the skills as we wrap up that folks are interested in hearing is, um, again, more language to express the issues that we talk about, specific intentional technique to facilitate. I need to know more about cultures and the history of other people, how to address the concerns of um, someone in the space that is not like me, um, confidence to reach out, wisdom to be an ally, um, to be more comfortable with my own behaviors. Again, this is a tool that I have used in a more so unconventional practice. Sometimes I, I go to work with organizations and they say, we want to be inclusive. So we want to do anti-racism training, unconscious bias training and this. And I'm like, how do you know that that's what we need? <laughs> and you're like, well, we just heard that that's what everyone's doing. <laughs> and it sounds like in this space, people want very concrete skills on how to engage one-on-one -on -one or how to express themselves. Um, because maybe they have the knowledge already and they've been reading books and listening to tons of podcasts, but they aren't sure how to craft that language and they aren't, they aren't sure about, am I going to say this right or am I going to say this wrong? So making sure again that we're meeting people where they are um, and teaching them and also connecting them with the right resources and communities of practice um, and learning. So those are some insights and takeaways that I have and that really wraps up my time with you all this afternoon. I hope that you found this to be helpful in, um, in some way to give you some insight if you haven't come across restorative practices before, at least to give you an insight in what that could look like in the work that you do. I believe that there are so many applications um, of restorative practices, for example, as well as ways in which we can think about, um, you know, building a culture of inclusion, building a culture of belonging for, for everyone. So thank you so very much. Thank you for your contributions and for sharing um, with me this afternoon. Thank you so much for this wonderful workshop. And thank you all for attending. Before you go, I would like to ask you to click on the link in the chat, which if it's not there right now, will be there shortly. And this is for the program evaluation. I would also like to remind you about tomorrow's program. Scarlett Lewis, founder of the Choose Love Movement will be our keynote speaker. And if I may say, you don't want to miss this. I'm actually extremely excited to hear her speak, having read a little bit about the Choose Love program and all that it's about. Scarlett will share some of the tools with us that she developed to help create healthier and safer communities following the murder of her six-year-old son, Jesse, who died in the Sandy Hook school shooting in 2014. So out of that tragedy, she created this wonderful foundation and a movement for growth. The workshops that follow the keynote tomorrow will be led by Scarlett and her colleague, Shannon, who is the appointed, uh, the appointee in the New Hampshire governor's office on social and emotional well-being. If you have not yet registered, you can still register today. Again, thank you so very much, everyone. Thank you, love. Thank you for, to Yulika for putting this all together so beautifully and um, have a wonderful rest of your day.